Today's topic for discussion is common infections of the skin. And uh, in when we encounter common infections of skin, we encounter various conditions like abscess, cellulitis, as well as boils, simple boils, or the, like sty and blind boils, etc. So today we'll discuss about this uh, cl various clinical features about them and how do you actually treat and any surgical procedures that have to be done in case of this common infections of the skin. So coming to the most common <clears throat> infections are small boils, also called as uh, pharyngeals. Normally these boils are nothing but uh, a small abscess kind of stuff which occurs at the hair follicle or it is also called as folliculitis or perifolliculitis. Follicle, uh, around the follicle or at the follicle region what happens is there will be an infection usually caused by Staphylococcus species and this will lead to formation of boils or pharyngeals. For example, if these boils of pharyngeals usually occur on the eye uh, hair follicle of the eyelids, then it is called as uh, sty. Or sometimes what happens is normally these boils of pharyngeals they have separation, that is they have pus formation within themselves because of a cellular necrosis that has been undergoing there. So if that separation is absent or if that separation is not present and boil is just as present as a small uh, you know uh, uh, elevation or infection around the hair follicle without any separation and it is called as blind boil normally these boils what happened is what is the what is their pathological feature is whenever uh, an infection is present especially because of the staphylococcus species there the separation starts because of central necrosis or central cell death or central necrosis which will lead to separative mechanism with the central necrosis and surrounding separation uh, usually seen as small uh, uh, elevated uh, pustules kind of stuff. These are called as boils or pharyngeals. Uh, as we have discussed, blind boil is there, there will not be any separation. And in case of a stipe, it is eyelash uh, follicle irritation or eyelash follicle infection is called as stipe. Normally, these uh, boils or pharyngeals usually occur at regions wherever there is skin. Remember, wherever there is skin and the uh, hair, I'm sorry, wherever there is hair, especially with hair follicles so at, because it is an infection of hair follicle uh, at areas with presence of hair can lead to boils usually most common uh, uh, areas is eyelash area and at the ne uh, neck region especially at the occipital area and also in the groin region and in the axilla, axilla also we, we, uh, we commonly encounter with this boils or pharyngeals and coming to the clinical features of them how they actually appear Usually they start with the erythematous or tender area uh, with the uh, mild, you know, painful injurated swelling can be seen in those cases. They'll be very much, very tender. This, these boils of pharyngeals are usually very tender and they have an indurated surface which later develop with central necrosis and surrounding separation. They develop into boils. It is also within the inside, within inside of these boils, we can see something called as something like greenish slough kind. And this slough is nothing but the necrotic material, the cells that have been dying and the uh, some amount of bacteria that is nothing but the staphylococcus species present within them. They actually appear like a greenish slough there. So, <clears throat> when we actually come to the complications of this, there is something called as hydradenitis in the axilla, axillary stuff, axillary region because of multiple amount of hair follicles are present and these multiple hair follicles undergo uh, uh, th there will be more amount of uh, you know boils or pharyngeals that can be seen leading to hydradenitis usually a common complication of this uh, uh, pharyngeals or boils and this is uh, very much tender patients usually uh, come with a chief complaint that there is tenderness erythematous areas and small boils or pustules present around the hair follicular region so this is one of the complication of uh, of these boils or pharyngeals. So how do we actually manage them? Most of the times these are self-healing. They heal with the granulation tissue within itself but sometimes uh, they actually grow in a bit uh, bigger size and uh, they are extremely painful in some conditions. So in those conditions a small iodine dab will be helpful in breaking the pustule there. Antibiotics are usually not prescribed in these cases. However, if there is multiple number of boils or pharyngeals present, then we prescribe antibiotics and uh, most commonly penicillin will be helpful in treating these cases, penicillin, erythromycin, etc. Now, coming to another condition called as abscess. Abscess, as we all know, is nothing but collection, localized collection of pus within a cavity or within a body. So, 
uh, in this picture what we can actually see there is underneath the skin there is this underneath the epidermal layer we can see and underneath the uh, epithelial layer we can see collection of pus within the body so it is nothing but uh, uh, collection of pus within the body which is usually lined by a pyogenic membrane now coming to abscesses we have different types of abscess and the most common varieties of abscess we see are nothing but pyogenic abscess pyemic abscess and collapses when you're talking about pyogenic abscess it is nothing but that's a collection of pus there and usually associated with some infection for example tooth caries with this carious material caused by streptococcus mutans or streptococcus species what happens is there will be collection of pus at the periapical region or within the sulcus or the gingiva so whenever there is a collection of pus then uh, uh, especially due to a reaction of uh, you know due to a, a bacterial infection then we call it as pyogenic abscess all the pyogenic abscesses have something called as uh, some yellowish alkaline fluid which is called as pus so what how do we define this pus pus is nothing but an yellow alkaline fluid which is resulting from a separative infection usually caused because of streptococcus species and here what happens is we can see liquefaction of the dead tissues by proteolytic enzymes that are released because of the polymorphonuclear leukocytes. When this material is present, then it, is, it develops into something called as pus. Whenever this pus has to drain out by through some mechanism, but if it is not draining out and it is collected within a small cavity, and if patient is continuously using antibiotics to get rid of this, sometimes what happens is this localized pus gets consolidated and it gets hardened. This is called as antibioma which actually contains sterile pus. It is an antibioma is nothing but a firm abscess cavity which contains sterile pus. Sometimes what happens because of its firmness and adherent to underlying structures and you know very uh, when they indurated margins around it because of its chronicity it usually resembles uh, a carcinomatous growth. So whenever we are taking a we are seeing a case of antibioma always have a differential diagnosis of carcinomatous growth in your mind and el elicit the history of patient elicit the history of usage of excessive antibiotics for a chronic period of time and also look for any local foci of infection whenever we see a local foci of infection and if the patient has been using uh, you know long term antibiotics then we can think about of uh, about antibioma in those cases now how is how this uh, uh, you know how this abscess uh, manifest itself what are the clinical features abscess is an inflammatory reaction is an inflammatory process producing pus there so it will have all kind all the five cardinal features of inflammation it will have rubber there will be erythematous area usually if the abscess is you know bigger in size what happens the skin or the abscess gets stretched and it uh, the skin appears shiny and it will be erythematous in color okay then rubber color color is rise in temperature so there will be elevated temperature when palpated when when the abscess has been palpated or when we touch the uh, abscess surface then it will usually have an elevated temperature when compared to other adjacent normal side then it will have uh, it will also have some uh, uh, pain tenderness that is when when we touch the uh, area then it is usually tender and sometimes because it is having a pus within it which is, has not been consolidated into an antibioma in those cases it is usually soft in consistency and fluctuating borders are usually diffuse uh, in bo diffuse borders but we can actually uh, you know well delineate its uh, whole surface well we can delineate it, delineate it from the adjacent surfaces then it will also have a uh, the final feature that is nothing but functional is a where sometimes the function of that local area will be hampered this is because of the other inflammatory features that is uh, because of a pain and all patient usually tries to limit the function of that particular area so these are the various clinical features of this abscess you know and uh, pyogenic abscess what are the investigations that we do for them first of all these pyogenic abscesses are usually associated with some acute infections for example acute osteomyelitis conditions in case of a uh, uh, acute uh, you know infectious uh, lesions etc we can see these kind of you know uh, gangrenous tissue present uh, in those cases we actually see these kind of pyogenic abscesses coming to investigations for example if there is a tooth decay uh, and it has been entered into the pulpal chamber and uh, reached the periapical region and then you have an abscess there dentoalveolar abscess this dental alveolar abscess may further uh, you know go into or progress into osteomyelitic lesions where it involves the medullary spaces of your bone 
In those conditions to investigate, we actually require a radiograph. In those conventional radiographs will help us uh, in identifying any abscesses in a bony tissue. In other deeper structures, for example, within the viscera, where there is an abscess within the liver or abscess within the spleen, ultrasound is a best diagnostic technique for us to identify if there is any uh, underlying abscess within these visceral organs. Coming to, uh, we can also go ahead with MRI, especially in the cases of a brain abscess or in case of any visceral organs, it will, MRI will actually delineate between an abscess and a, uh, and a carcinomatous growth where the central necrosis is happening sometimes. So to, uh, to de delineate from abscess and the carcinomatous growth, uh, MRI will be helpful for this. However, we have other uh, nuclear medicine cases, especially if there is any inflammation within your, uh, in the brain or any bony structures, if there is any inflammatory abscess that is going within the bony structures, then we can go with the help of PET scan, where we can, uh, these inflammatory, uh, inflammatory uh, areas will appear as a uh, red hot spot cut hot spots within this. So these are various investigations that we actually helpful in identifying any abscess. Other important and major important or uh, you know the gold standard test is always culture and sensitivity test. Culture, culture of the pus that has been taken will be helpful in identifying the causative organism and thus we can actually start treatment for that particular organism with the help of sensitivity test. So other investigations will be uh, your again uh, comes comes like your culture and sensitivity apart from the special investigations. Now coming to the management, especially in the case of abscesses, uh, best treatment is best line of treatment is antibiotics. In these antibiotics, penicillin is always the first line of choice, and we can also go with the help with metronidazole in case of deep infections where uh, we suspect an anaerobic infection. However, if patient is uh, sensitive to uh, penicillin, then we can go ahead with erythromycin. And also we can also go with other cephalosporin drugs in those cases. One important thing that has to be remembered is whenever there is pus, allow it to drain. If the pus is drained, then healing will be fastened. So drainage of pus is very important uh, feature or very important management uh, protocol in case of treating any abscesses. <clears throat> so this drainage of pus is how do you actually drain this pus? We have to give an incision, right? So when we are giving an incision, we have two techniques. One is free incision or liberal incision and other is Hilton's procedure. In free incision, what happens is always whenever there is an abscess, a consolidated abscess is present, then give it, give an incision in the most prominent and most dependent part. Why most dependent part is because if there is, uh, we give an incision at the most dependent part, because of gravity, the pus can be drained. In the most prominent part also when we give an incision, it actually allows the, uh, it is the most softened area. So it allows the pus to drain from the most prominent part. Normally this free incision or uh, a liberal incision will, will, whenever we are giving that incision, we have to take care that there are no, or uh, we, are, we are not cutting down or we are not incising any vital structures present there. For example, nerves or blood vessels. If you, are, uh, if you think uh, that there is any nerve or if there is any muscle fibers that are present in the line of incision, always give an incision in a parallel way. You have to cut it or give an incision in parallelly to the muscles which are present or muscular fibers that are present or towards the nerves. Now coming to Hilton's method of incision. Usually this Hilton's method of incision will help, will be helpful or it is most, uh, you know, uh, chosen method when we have very vital structures that are present near to your biogenic abscesses. In this condition, what we do, you also, we, similar to our free incision or liberal incision, what we do is we give an incision at the most prominent and most dependent path, dependent part of your abscess. After giving an incision, we take an artery forceps or mosquito forceps, enter your abscess cavity, you know, if this is the cavity, we have given an incision here. So we enter the abscess cavity with the artery forceps like this. And then after going into the abscess cavity, we open your forceps there. By opening the forceps, what you are doing is we are explorating, we are explorating the whole abscess cavity there and you're breaking the locules that are present within this abscess cavity. So by breaking the locules, what happens? We are allowing the uh, uh, we, are, we are removing all the walls between them and creating a, a one whole cavity. That's uh, thus giving a better drain inside. So when we're removing it, do not always remember in the Hilton sensation when we give, after we open the forceps like this, remove your forceps in the same way. Do not close your forceps and remove because this may cause any entrapment of 
any vital structures that are present within this abscess cavity or any structures that are present within it when we clone what happens we are pulling it down along with your forceps so when you are removing your forceps do not close open it in the same way and try to remove your artery forceps from inside after removing what happens sometimes the wall or the opening that we have given can collapse so to prevent it collapse what you can do we can actually place a drain within it we can actually place some a tube a drain within it which will allow the pus to drain off from the drain so this is nothing but your hilton's method of incision usually uh, selected when we have when we uh, i mean whenever there are many vital structures that are present near to the abscess uh, surrounding so so these are various types of incisions that is nothing but free incision or liberal incision and we have hilton's method of incision for example in this case we have a abscess in relation you know, in uh, in the uh, upper uh, left you know in the upper left uh, vestibule the, so we actually gave an incision small incision there and we have we we, we have made with the scalpel we have given an incision in the third picture we can see we have in, we have put a artery forceps within it and then we have tried to break the locules after removing your artery forceps we have placed a drain and to stabilize the drain we made we gave a suture so this will allow the pus to come out or to drain off and after the three days also we can remove off the uh, drain again and give another normal suture to close off the ends of this okay so this is how the hilton's incision procedure is taking place now coming to other abscesses you know based upon the location of the abscess we also have different types of abscess like abscess of the neck abscess of the neck is usually seen in the case of especially in the nape of the neck and uh, deltoid abscess usually in the deltoid region in deltoid abscess uh, it is the most common cause for it is because of uh, an injections any intramuscular injections that are usually given in the deltoid region here what happens is there is a small uh, abscess that can some uh, kind of abscess usually because of using unsterile method uh, while giving this abscesses which while giving the in uh, injection so when we are giving this intramuscular injection we have to be careful in uh, in uh, you know sterilizing the area where we are giving this injection so in deltoid abscess whenever we see a deltoid abscess a free incision will be helpful or liberal incision will be helpful in draining of this abscess condition now abscess of axilla even in this abscess of axilla also because it can be because of uh, uh, you know my, uh, hydrodenitis condition again because of multiple uh, hair follicles are present any infection of these follicles in this region can also lead to uh, you know abscess of the axilla and we have popliteal abscess uh, and we have other abscess like groin abscess and gluteal abscess gluteal abscess is again a condition it is also because of uh, any uh, intramuscular injections uh, which will lead to, lead to any abscess in these cases now iliac abscess and abscess of sole of sole or heel also is present in abscess of sole or heel it is more usually because of any prick of thrown in this regions so leading to abscess in the sole or heel region now coming to other type of infection in abscess that is nothing but pyemic abscess pyemic abscess is because of infected emboli these infected emboli can uh, rupture and they can spread into different areas causing this pyemic abscess in this what happens is because of the rupturing of this infected emboli we can see multiple foci of secondary infections where multiple secondary foci of separation can be seen in this cases of pyemic abscess usually uh, because of this uh, an infected emboli can also uh, disrupted infected emboli can also lead to septic emboli now coming to this features of pyemic abscess these features of pyemic abscess include all the inflammatory signs again patient usually complain of fever patient has this uh, you know wherever the abscess is present then we can see uh, uh, tenderness in the region fever rigors chills can be seen in these cases of pyemic abscess again the pyemic abscess can be because of any deep infections or deep abscesses such as osteomyelitis lesions acute osteomyelitic acute liver abscesses in case of acute splenic abscess we can see this pyemic abscess conditions in this pyemic abscess we have three conditions again they have we have bacteremia we have toxemia and we have septicemia coming to bacteremia it is usually a transient condition or if bacteremia occurs also it is normally a uh, it is not something that we have to be frightened of as the name itself indicates that they are they are uh, uh, you know ingress of bacteria into the blood stream usually this occurs after a trauma or after any incision that is given uh, while uh, uh, treating a case because of uh, unsterile instruments or anything we can also see transient bacteremia immediately after brushing every day in the morning because uh, through the gingival what happens or through the gingival sulcus or through the minor uh, circulation present within the gingiva the uh, organisms that are present on the teeth will actually enter into the blood 
So bacteremia is a condition which usually will not cause much of uh, you know clinical importance. So we have something called a septicemia. This actually is important in terms of clinical conditions. In the septicemia, what happens is along with the, this bacteria, this bacteria releases certain toxins called as exotoxins or endotoxins. These toxins will actually cause this uh, something called as septicemia leading to various clinical conditions. Patients usually will have fever, rigor, tremors. You know, they have this multiple skin infections here. In this picture, we can see there are multiple skin lesions present at the legs of the patient because of septicemia. Now, how do this septicemia actually occur? What is the route of entry into the blood? It can either occur because of any minor trauma or any minor laceration where the bacteria can ingress uh, leading to exotoxin release. It can occur because of any beta hemolytic streptococcus species, especially streptococcus pyogenes. And we also have alpha hemolytic streptococcus that is nothing but streptococcus viridens. Next is something called as toxemia. In this toxemia, uh, as, as nothing but uh, as, uh, uh, similar to septicemia, what happens, the multiple toxins are released within the body. So how do we manage these conditions? Management is, if at all we see uh, uh, septicemia, we actually have to uh, give patient with antibiotics. Penicillin is the first line of choice in this condition. And in case of any severe, uh, uh, you know, uh, imbalance in the water, water uh, uh, imbalance, electrolyte water imbalance in these cases because of vomitings or diarrhea, etc. In those cases, we actually replace a patient with, uh, you know, this uh, fluid electrolyte balance has to be restored in these cases. Now coming to cold abscess. Cold abscess is something where we can uh, usually see in cases of, uh, you know, it is actually a sequel of tuberculous infections. In this, it is, uh, why it is called as cold abscess? It is because it does not have all the features of inflammatory conditions like, like we have it in pyogenic abscess. In this, uh, these abscess are usually because of non-reacting in nature and there will be caseation necrosis within the abs, within the, uh, within this abscess condition. Normally, cold abscess are usually uh, occurring in the neck region, uh, you know, wherever the, we have lymph nodes in the submandibular and the jugular lymph nodes, in the axillary region, in the inguinal, inguinal region are most common sites of this cold abscess, especially the cholesterol or cold abscess is usually seen in the neck region, okay? And then we have the soft and matted lymph nodes in this region, matted lymph nodes because it is a sequel of tuberculosis, as we already said. Cold abscess or cholesterol abscess is usually a sequel of tuberculosis. So in this tuberculosis what happens, the lymph nodes are usually soft in consistency, they are usually non-tender and sometimes tender if there is secondly infected and they have a matted lymph nodes. You know, you can actually, uh, when we are palpating the lymph nodes, all the lymph nodes which are present together move along, move at a time. You know, they move alongside with at once. So this is nothing but matted lymph nodes. Coming to the management, anti-tubercular treatment will obviously heal the cold abscess. So, and now we are treating for this cold abscess, anti-tubercular drugs will, uh, will be useful. I mean, treatment for tuberculosis has to be done in, for treating this cold abscess. So, these are about abscesses. We have seen about pyogenic, pyemic and cold stud abscess or cold stud abscess. Now, we are talking about carbuncle. Carbuncle is nothing but a condition where it is an infective gangrene of subcutaneous tissues. Here, it is caused because of Staphylococcus aureus and most commonly, uh, areas are again nape of the neck, buttock region, and also in the back, back of the you know back region, etc. We have we see this uh, carbuncle. Okay, this is a picture where we can see carbuncle on the buttock, and if you properly examine this condition along with the ulcerated region, we see multiple sieve-like structures, some multiple sinus openings, which are actually causing, which are leading the pus to drain. So. Carbuncle has something called a characteristic feature called sieve-like. You know, we have, we know the sieve, right? It the there are multiple sinus openings which occur, which come out through the skin and they appear sieve-like. So this is a pathognomic feature of carbuncle. Coming to the pathology, how it occurs? It actually uh, occurs because of any uh, incision or any wound, etc., which actually penetrate deep into the subcutaneous tissues. When it penetrates deep into the subcutaneous tissues. There, the process of abscess can continues there because of any uh, colligative necrosis. This colligative necrosis, which actually formed an abscess, now will communicate as series of communicating abscess. When these series of communicating abscess from the center will come out through the surface with the help of multiple sinus openings. These multiple sinus openings actually appear like a sieve-like, which is the pathognomic feature of your carbuncle. So this is nothing but sieve-like or cribriform openings onto the surface of the skin. 
when we actually see the surface when the floor of the uh, not base of the ulcer it appears ash gray slough which is again a pathognomonic feature of your carbuncle so how do we actually treat it management is again basically with the help of antibiotics penicillin is our first line of choice with erythromycin can also be given in these cases we have whenever we are talking about carbuncle by dapping it with the help of anhydrous magnesium sulfate or glycerin this will actually remove of the slough that is present within this uh, uh, carbuncle ulcer so by removing it off we actually get a dry surface there which heals faster whenever there is an abscess consolidated but there are no multiple sinus openings in those conditions what we do we give hot compressions to the carbuncle hot compressions here we can also use diathermy so this will uh, our ultrasound uh, heat moist heat can also be given in these regions whenever we actually give a hot therapy to it or hot compressions to it what happens the uh, abscess gets softened and it comes out through sin multiple sinus opening as we know the rule whenever there is pus drain it out that is a rule in treating any pus related disorders any abscess related conditions whenever there is pus drain the pus half of the disease is gone okay with the help of this hot compressions we are removing all the whatever the underlying pus is present we are letting it out with the with the help of this hot compressions diathermy or ultrasound therapy etc finally finally when antibiotics are not working when uh, when this anhydrous magnesium sulfate is not working then we go with surgery in the surgery what we do is we give an incision deep remove it off remove the whole of the carbuncle as it is and then we we actually give dressing to the uh, underlying tissue and it will we'll try to promote healing with the help of antibiotics then so surgery is our last mode of choice whenever we, we whenever these other uh, you know treatment modules are not functioning now let us go to the next topic that is nothing but cellulitis in this cellulitis what happens is it is usually a non separative inflammation remember cellulitis is infection which has been spread into multiple anatomical planes along the if two or more spaces are involved in in an if an abscess involves two or more spaces then it leads to cellulitis it is a non separative inflammatory condition usually caused because of streptococcus pyogenes and the most common infection is streptococcus pyogenes in these conditions so what are the clinical features because it involves more than two surfaces what happens is the skin surface is enlarged or skin is usually stretched instead of enlarged it is usually stretched skin is shiny and the the swelling is usually soft to firm in consistency brawny induration can be seen in these cases uh the, usually the cellulitis is tender when we talk about the lymph nodes especially if, if there is a cellulitis condition uh when we talk about the lymph nodes the lymph nodes are usually enlarged palpable soft they are tender and they are mobile and when we when we are coming to the any portal of entry how we actually this happened there would definitely be some a uh, lesion there either a dental caries or a cut or trauma or any incision that has been made by surgeon or any surgical incision that has been present which has been further infected so there will definitely be portal of entry now coming to treatment in these cases also in case of cellulitis when we are trying to treat the case usually antibiotics are again a first line of choice with penicillin erythromycin metronidazole uh, penicillin or erythromycin metronidazole for deep lying infections and sometimes what happens is to reduce the inflammatory edema we can also give cerastro peptidase in these cases fine when we are actually talking about uh, surgical incision it is always better to uh, in case of cellulitis to get down the infection and then go with any surgical procedures for example if there are dental caries try uh, after giving an antibiotic coverage remove the offending teeth or go go ahead with a root canal treatment in those conditions so this is about cellulitis and we are talking about erysipelas erysipelas is again a condition which is an acute inflammation of the lymphatics okay and the condition is usually caused with the help with the uh, due to organisms like streptococcus uh, hemolytic group a that is streptococcus pyogenes infection here what happens is erysipelas has a characteristic condition characteristic characteristic or pathognomonic feature where it has a rose red or rose pink colored a uh, rash is seen usually in this cases in case of erysipelas we see a rose pink the margins are usually advancing like in on a paper when we actually put a grease or an oil mark it usually advances into the surrounding areas right like similarly in case of erysipelas this rose red rash is present which will which with uh, has us advanced uh, surrounding margins in case of this erysipelas see now in this picture we can see that nice 
uh, rash we can see, I mean the well-defined rash, we, if you can see there's a bright advancing margins are present along the periphery of the lesion, okay. We have something called as Milan's ear sign. In this Milan's ear sign what happens is this LC palace will spread into the pinna of the ear and in this pinna of the ear what happens is because it is trying to enlarge, usually patient will have severe pain. When we are differentiating this, uh, you know, cellulitis with this uh, uh, in, uh, LC palace condition, usually cellulitis will not involve the pinna of the ear, whereas LC palace can involve the pinna of the ear. So, Millard's ear sign is nothing but when LC palace spreads into the pinna of the ear, it is called as Millard's ear sign. So, how do you manage again LC palace condition? It is usually managed, uh, I mean, with the help of antibiotics again. Uh, and uh, in this cases, you have to remember that erysipelas usually, uh, in case of diabetic patients, you know, they, it has or immunocompromised patients, erysipelas can aggravate. So, control the condition of underlying diabetic condition for better healing of this uh, condition. In case of erysipelas, <clears throat> as we have seen that there is a, you know, a rose red rash. In this also, we have central pus formation can be seen. Sometimes small vesicular eruptions can be seen on over this uh, erysipelatic lesion which will actually have serious discharge. Uh, and this is about Ercipalus and we have seen uh, all the various other kind of common skin infections which I'll just uh, repeat the names of them. We have seen about abscess, we have seen carbuncle or foil, uh, furuncle and then uh, uh, we have seen carbuncle, we have seen furuncle or boil, we have seen abscess. Abscess also we have seen different kinds of abscess, pyogenic, pyogenic abscess and gold abscess or cholesterol abscess and Ercipalus. So these are about the common skin infections. Knowing about them will actually help us because all these infections that we have studied can occur in head and neck region also, which we may commonly encounter in the clinical setup or in our dental setup, especially abscess and uh, you know cellulitis are two most common infections that we actually encounter in a dental office. So knowing about them, understanding what the clinical features will be there and understanding how to actually differentiate from cellulitis and erysipelas will give us a better insight into the clinical findings and you know better insight into the diagnosis and also you know, the treatment outcome also would be better in those cases. So this is about the common uh, skin infections. Thank you.